And one thing that was pretty enlightening for me was when I launched the podcast, The Flip Empire Show in 2016, I remember 2018 is when it started to gain some traction and I would have genuine joy and fulfillment when somebody would reach out to me about the impact a particular show or episode had on them and their business. That felt greater to me than closing the next deal. And I've always had a heart for service. I've always genuinely wanted to help and pour into people. And that's when I knew, like, I think what's in alignment with my purpose is in working with entrepreneurs, like helping them. And real estate is just a vehicle and a tool. So people might be surprised to hear that I am not passionate about real estate. I happen to be pretty decent at it, but it's just what I do. It doesn't define who I am. Where I get significant joy and fulfillment is having conversations like this pouring into other entrepreneurs, having them pour into me and just growing, building relationships. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money because the money comes first. Now, here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, and I'm so excited to have my guest on today. He's a dear friend. We've known each other for many, many years. And since we talk about raising private money on this show, my friend and guest just recently raised $1,450,000 to purchase his 37,175 square foot storage facility. So yes, we're going to talk about how you can make a lot of money in storage facilities here on this show. Now, a little bit about my friend's background. Now, years ago, way back in 2005, I think he was five years old when he started this. Anyway, he started wholesaling and flipping single family houses in the Miami market back in 2005. And he's closed like over 700 transactions. But then something changed in 2020, 15 years down the road. He changed and he transitioned from doing the house business over to storage facilities. So he currently owns three storage facilities in Florida and Mississippi. He's got over 104,000 net rentable square feet. So what has my friend done? Well, he's combined his experience of coaching entrepreneurs and he's combined it with his knowledge of owning and operating storage facilities. So now what does he focus on? He's focused on helping people like you purchase their very first cash flowing storage facility within six months of starting to work on it without having any experience and, you know, I love this part, without needing any of your own money. Now, for years, uh, he has had the podcast that I have been privileged to be a guest on. His podcast is called Flip Empire Show. It's a top-rated Apple podcast designed to help anyone achieve freedom and personalized lifestyle through real estate investing. So his show, Flip Empire, was launched all the way back in 2016 and he's had industry thought leaders and he covers all kinds of topics on his show like entrepreneurship, real estate investing, marketing, team building, and on and on and on. Most importantly, how he and I connected originally was through our faith. His vision is he lives out being a man of faith and a family man first. In just a moment, you're going to meet my dear friend and fellow successful real estate investor, Alex Pardo, right after this. Oh, my lands, Alex. I'm so excited to have you here on the show, man. I mean, you know, just looking at just looking at your smile just lights me up from one side to the other. But welcome back to the show, Alex. It's so good to see you. Jay, it is an honor and a pleasure, brother. Uh, man, you emit so much positive energy. We were just talking backstage how every time I see you, it's hard not to smile around you, brother. So thank you for the opportunity to share. And I'm really looking forward to being on your show. Well, I tell you what, we're going to dive in. So obviously we're going to talk about raising private money. 
since yep. this is raising private money podcast and show, but we're also going to talk about self storage. And of course this goes hand in hand because, you know, you raise private money for self storage and you can raise private money like I do for single family houses and apartments and anything that you want to in real estate. But before we dive in to raising private money and talking about self storage and all that kind of good stuff, we want to hear your story. And Alex, my lands, have you got a story because you built this like massive wholesaling business empire way back. And you sort of figured out that what you were doing just didn't really align with who you were. Yeah. And then, you know, you didn't know who you were. You had the self-identity crisis and stuff. <laughs> and yeah. then you like changed gears totally to a whole different, uh, you know, space of real estate investing. Tell us the journey. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Jay. Um, so I'm an open book. I'm going to be extremely vulnerable and transparent with you. But, you know, I I got started in 2005 and I had quite a bit of success throughout the years. And of course, I had adversity and I had setbacks throughout that time building a business as as everybody does. But in 2018, Jay, I was on a cruise with my wife and I'll never forget because it kind of felt like a fork in the road moment for me. And I remember that I had built a team and we had the typical structure of lead managers and acquisition managers and all the team members. I think we had eight or nine team members at the time. And yet I told my wife, even though I'm on this cruise, I, I'm having a hard time being present because the mind is on the business. I mm. felt, Jay, like I had built prison walls around my business and I didn't have the key to get out. Like that's literally what I felt like. And around the same time that you and I met in a very high level community, which I have nothing but great things to say, amazing people. If I'm being honest with you and with the audience, I fell, I felt like I felt like I fell into a trap of feeling like I needed to grow and scale because that's what I saw others around me doing. Mm. And I violated an important rule is that I didn't honor my vision, right? So I, I'm a big believer that you need to have a clearly defined vision for your life. And then you can go out and create or modify a business to enhance that vision. And yet, I, I don't know if it was ego or what it was, but I felt like what I needed to do was grow and scale and yet a couple of years later, I quickly realized this is the exact opposite of what I want. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and brother, it got to a point where, you know, I had overhead of north of $40,000 a month, right? Mm -hmm. Just to keep the lights on. And at the end of 2019, when I looked back and while our top line was very healthy, the bottom line, I made more in 2006 as a solopreneur than I did in 2019 with a team mm. of nine people and 40 plus thousand dollars of overhead. So mm. uh, the business just no longer aligned with my vision. And after just a lot of prayer and consulting with the right people around me, I ultimately decided to completely unwind and shut down the business uh, in 2020. It had nothing mm. to do with COVID. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, here I am, I host this podcast and I, I've built up this reputation in the business. Like, what are people going to think if they hear that I shut down this business? And what I quickly realized was that A, people are not concerned about me, right? Like people have their own stuff that they're concerned about. So I was giving myself way too much importance. And B, it at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what people think. Like I asked myself an important question. I said, if I am doing what I'm doing today, 12 months from now, how would that make me feel? And it took me back to when I worked in my corporate finance job on a Sunday evening, having to wake up and go to work. But this was much worse because I had created this business. And even though it was profitable, it's just not what I wanted to do. So long story short, I, uh, I shut down the business. Uh, I got some really great advice from a coach of mine who told me, enjoy the fruits of your labor, take time to connect with God. Like don't feel rushed to go conquer the next mountain. And I took about five, six months off mini sabbatical. And uh, late 2020 is when I ultimately decided, hey, I'm going to transition and go full-time into self-storage. You said something important a moment ago. You said that you realized that this company that you had built was not in alignment with your goals. Let's right. dig into that a little bit. Yeah. Specifically, 
what was going on that did not uh, that did not line up or was not yeah. in alignment? Yeah, great question. Um, I got into real estate, like I would imagine many of your listeners, because I wanted time freedom at the end of the day, right? Like people always say, I want X amount of money, but it's what the money can do for you. And yet I found myself on this like hamster wheel where I was constantly chasing deals. I was going deal after deal after deal. And one thing that was pretty enlightening for me was when I launched the podcast, The Flip Empire Show in 2016, I remember 2018 is when it started to gain some traction and I would have genuine joy and fulfillment when somebody would reach out to me about the impact a particular show or episode had on them and their business. That felt greater to me than closing the next deal. And I've always had a heart for service. I've always genuinely wanted to help and pour into people. And that's when I knew, like, I think what's in alignment with my purpose is in working with entrepreneurs, like helping them. And real estate is just a vehicle and a tool. So people might be surprised to hear that I am not passionate about real estate. I happen to be pretty decent at it, but it's just what I do. It doesn't define who I am. Where I get significant joy and fulfillment is having conversations like this, pouring into other entrepreneurs, having them pour into me and just growing, building relationships. Um, and so that's what I ultimately decided to do is I said, hey, I'm going to use storage as a vehicle to allow me to connect and pour into people. So uh, I didn't know exactly where I was going to be when I started storage, but I, I was clear what I didn't want. And it was a transactional business in nature. Tell me if I am interpreting your story correctly. When you say that when you were doing the wholesaling business and it was deal after deal, after deal, after deal that you and the team were chasing and you said that didn't align with your goals or didn't, didn't line up with who you truly were is, are you, were you saying that that business just wasn't giving you the joy that you were looking for? Yeah, I would say it's a part of it. Look, I, I'm not bashing on wholesaling at all. I, I, I wholesaling got me to where I am today. It was a, it was a cash generating business and I'm so grateful for everything I learned in that business. Right. But when I say it wasn't aligned, it wasn't providing cash flow. There was a lot of moving parts in the business. And even though we had a lot of systems and procedures and SOPs and team members, and I wasn't the one necessarily like wearing the hats, talking to sellers, buyers, I was managing the team and it just felt like it was a very challenging business to fully systematize and automate, right? And, and one of the things that I now know with storage is that because of technology, like, you know, three facilities, I don't have any employees. It just provides more time freedom. When I was wholesaling and I was chasing deal after deal after deal, it just always felt like I was having to go after the next one and the next one. And it was a business that didn't provide cash flow unless we were closing deals. And I really like what I like about commercial in general and specifically storage is that you can find the right deal and it pays you month after month after month. And that's what my wholesaling business was lacking. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, something else you said was very important and I want to unpack it or ask you to unpack it a little bit. You said in your wholesaling business, you really had built these pre to find the key to get out. Yeah. What do you mean by that? What, what, what represented the prison walls? I was, I had created a business I no longer wanted to be a part of, right? Like the model in general, where I got joint fulfillment was in working with the team members. Like that's the one thing that I did right is that I brought on the right people on my team. And I had a genuine desire to see them succeed. And I think this could potentially have been a fault. I, I went on too long with this business because I didn't, I wanted them, I wanted to provide this business for them to succeed, but it just no longer, I wasn't having fun in the business. I was mm. constantly tired of, you know, here in South Florida, pretty cutthroat market, you know, people going around your back and trying to poach deals and just last minute deals falling out of contract or this or that. And look, don't get me wrong. I wasn't trying to run away from challenges in business because I truly believe any business is going to have its fair share of challenges. And I don't want to be on this podcast and pretend like I have everything figured out because that's just not the case. Like I deal with my fair share of challenges and adversity like anybody else. But it was, it just constantly felt like the same fires that we were being put out. And no matter how many people I put or systems I implemented, 
it just felt like uh, it, wholesaling is not complicated, but there's a lot of moving parts to that business. And somebody asked me something very important. They said, hey, Alex, you've been in this business 15, 16 years. Have you built it in a way where it could be sold? And I said, you know, all these years, no. Like, yes, I've generated a lot of money in this business and it's provided for my family. But while I have sellable assets within the business, no, I don't believe I've created and structured the business in a way that it was saleable. Uh, and so that really resonated with me. And I just felt in addition to the fact that I was being taxed at the highest bracket, um, I just said, you know what, this is not the right game for me to be playing. That makes a lot of sense. Now you have got experience on knowing what it feels like to be in a business, even if you build it yourself, not happy, not being fulfilled, not having joy, feeling like the business is running you yeah. and you're not running the business. Yeah. You know what that feels like. And you have also experienced being free of that. Mm -hmm. So with that being the case, here's my question. What advice would you give to anyone that's listening to this show that is feeling that right now? They feel like they're caught in a trap. They yeah. feel like they're maybe in that day job that they can't get out of. Or maybe they are an entrepreneur and they have built this business and they just don't feel like there is a way out. What advice would you give them on how to get out? Yeah, first of all, there's a lot of empathy coming from this side of the mic because I know my, my initial gut reaction is to tell you to be bold. Like in order for things to change, something has to change. I'm also cognizant and mindful of the fact that a lot of people listening to me, you know, have responsibilities. They likely have families, kids, married. And, and it's sometimes it's easy to say, Hey, just make a hard pivot, like right exit stage left and like go after what you want. But I really think it's important that you start to build a bridge. First of all, awareness, being very honest with yourself about where you're at and then accepting accountability and responsibility for where you're at. You are where you're supposed to be because of decisions you've made or because of certain indecision. So I think first awareness about where you are, then getting clarity about where you want to be, right? Like one of the exercises that I go through on a yearly basis is the perfect day. Like what is the perfect day look like for you? Create a crystal clear vision about what you want your life to look like without necessarily regards to money or finances, but like, how do you want to live your life? What do you want to experience? What do you want to feel? And don't filter based on, well, I'd like to live that life, but I can't because insert any limiting beliefs or reasons why you don't think that's a reality for you. So once you get that clarity, I think you can start to like build a bridge and reverse engineer from where you are today to where you're going. I can tell you, Jay, that people like you, right? Like relationships with coaches, with different communities I've been a part of have been an instrumental part of allowing me to build that bridge because as cliche as it sounds, Jay, we don't know what we don't know. And I have blind spots like anybody else. And I think when you surround yourself with people that are a little bit further along in the journey, they're able to spot those blind spots and share them with you, right? And give you certain things to consider. But at the end of the day, coaches, mentors, community members, they're not responsible for your success. At the end of the day, it boils down to you. And it's about taking massive imperfect action. I almost need to find a better way to say that, but you have to kind of just do activity, like put yourself out there and then you're going to fail. There's going to be lessons learned, but you, you modify, you edit. And then you keep going and you keep going. The last thing I'll share with you is um, I'm not here to try to like shove my faith down anybody's throat, but I truly believe at the end of the day, having a relationship with God, right? Just connecting with him, seeking wisdom and guidance from him. Uh, I realize that's going to turn some people off. Uh, I know you and I share the same faith and, and I'm okay with that because I truly believe that at the end of the day, like that is the foundation right? Um, with him, I believe all things are possible. And, uh, and he's just been a huge part of my journey and where I'm at today. And, and ultimately it gives me so much confidence knowing that I might not know how to do something or how to accomplish a particular goal, but if I could just continue to take actions, I continue to stack the micro, uh, actions, it's going to lead to the macro results that I'm after. Well, I appreciate you sharing where you're coming from on faith, Alex, because after all, he said, if we're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of us. Mm -hmm. So we, we will not be ashamed for sure. Uh, and at the same time, you know, 
I believe most of the audience that we have here on the show are believers as well, because I, you know, by the way, Alex, I don't know who in the world came up with the say and opposites attract. That's the most stupid thing I ever heard in my life. I want to hang around people that are like me. You know? I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. <laughs> so, yep. So therefore we are here on the show. Now, the name of this show, speaking of the show is raising private money. So let's talk about yeah. private money for a little bit. So yeah. you recently raised $1,450,000 for a yes, storage sir. facility that you purchased. So generally speaking, or specifically speaking, what are your, I mean, you've raised a lot of private money over the years. Yeah. What, what's your favorite ways to go about raising private money? And what advice would you give to someone that's never raised private money? How do they start? Yeah. So let me start by saying that you are the expert when it comes to private money. So anybody watching this, like, listen to Jay, don't listen to me. I do have some experience in raising private money and I'll kind of share with you what's worked for me. But again, Jay, you're, you're the expert in that domain. So for me, I, I truly believe, and hopefully this doesn't uh, turn some people off, but I don't believe that raising private money is the most important and valuable capital you can raise. I believe relationship capital is the most important and valuable capital you can raise. So my favorite way to raise private money is by tapping into relationships. Now, if you're looking for like the easy button, if you're looking for a strategy, a script, if you're looking for some ninja tactic to just instantly raise private money, I'm not your guy because I have taken the long approach when it comes to raising private money. And I did it because I've been intentional about building meaningful relationships with people. I'll also share that when I have been intentional about building relationships, it was never with the goal or with the intent that I was going to raise private money or for that matter, extract anything from that relationship. I've just approached relationships with a genuine heart that I want to seek to connect. I want to seek to like understand people. I have a genuine interest to figure out what are their goals? Like, what are they interested in? And I'm just myself, right? And so sometimes that might be hard to translate, but my, my biggest piece of advice for raising private capital and really for any aspect of your business is be your authentic, genuine self. Seek to build meaningful connection and relationship with people. And I can tell you that storage deal, you said it uh, a little bit over 37,000 square feet that I purchased at the beginning of 2023. That was probably one of the easiest deals I've ever done. And I say that because it, I, I, so I raised 1.45 from three private lenders, all of which I have a really good relationship with. And it was probably less than five or six phone calls and a few emails that it took to secure almost one and a half million dollars. And I can tell you, it wasn't because the deal was so amazing. It was because they were betting on me as the jockey, not necessarily the horse. Yes, it was a good deal. Yes, their money is secure and safe. But it was the fact that we had built the relationship over time that they know I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do and I'm going to follow through and do right by them. Because one of the things I think people need to understand, Jay, and I'm not sure if maybe you have a different take here, but I've always believed and feel free to challenge me on this. I've always believed that people are more interested in getting a return of their capital before they're interested in getting a return on their capital. And what I mean by that is that at the end of the day, people are looking to eliminate risk and they want to make sure that their principle is secure. And there's a variety of ways you can do that by putting them in first position. And there's a lot of different things we can talk about, right? But I think first from the perspective of a private lender, how do I make them feel safe and secure? And how do they know with confidence that they're going to get a return of their capital? And then I can talk about the kind of return they can get on their capital. But um, that's all a long way to say that my favorite way to raise private money is by just genuinely building meaningful connection and relationship with people. And then you leave breadcrumbs, you plant seeds about what you do, right? So the Bible talks about being humble and I, and I subscribe to that mentality. I also think that that pendulum can swing so far the other day that like I've had coaching clients that are gun shy or timid to share with people in their network, their ecosystem, that they are actively looking for storage deals. And I truly believe, Jay, that whether you're a wholesaler, a storage investor, whatever you do, when people think about your business or asset class, you are one of the first people that should come to the top of their mind. 
And the only way you're going to, that's going to happen is by you putting yourself out there and letting people know what it is you do and how they could benefit from participating in your deals. So when it comes to private money, I'm never chasing it. I'm never uh, begging for it. I'm not asking for money. I am presenting opportunities, but only after I've built relationship with people. Well, you sound like Jay Connor, Alex. So I couldn't agree with you more. And okay. you know, one, one thing you, one thing you said, I just really want to highlight for our listeners. And that is essentially your private lenders. They're not investing in your deals. They're really not. What are they doing? They're investing in you. That's where their belief is. That's where their trust is. Their trust is not in that deal. Their trust is in you. Now, of course, we're going to protect them. Um, I'm not going to borrow unsecured money. I, I'm going to collateralize their notes and take care of them. But, um, you know, as you said, when it comes to relationships, it's because of the relationship that they're actually investing. So as we start to wind down, Alex, let's talk about self-storage. So you've done wholesaling, you've done single family houses, you've done flips, uh, and you touched on it, but I want you to highlight it. Um, self storage. So why self storage? So yeah. it, it, it sounds like what you were saying is that self storage is not primarily a transactional business. It's more of a do the deal. And then that deal is going to take care of a long time instead of just flipping it and then having to go chase the next deal. Yeah. Well, it, it can, right? So I, I think people need to be clear on, you know, whatever asset class we're talking about, Jay, I truly believe that you need to define the exit before you get involved in the deal, right? And so there's specific deals that I've gotten involved in so that I could increase the net operating income of that storage facility, raise the value, turn around, sell it, take that capital, and then now redeploy it into another asset class. There's one particular um, uh, deal that I'm thinking about that it's a long-term hold. It's more of a cash flow play. Right. So um, why storage? Well, at the end of the day, storage is a business that has the benefits of real estate. Right. It's an actual business. Now, when we talk about this business, I think it's important to understand the day and age that we're in. Think about Americans like we live in a consumerism society. I don't know about you, Jay, but like I feel like every day or every other day, my wife has ordered something new from Amazon and like I walk up to my doorstep and I have packages there. Well, uh, people buy stuff and it's a very recession resistant asset class. So if the market is doing great, people are consuming, they need a place to store their stuff. If the market shifts and is not doing so great, oftentimes people need to downsize from their homes, but they don't want to get rid of their stuff. So it is not uncommon for our customers to rent storage and stay there for years. So it's a very sticky product. And I really love the fact that we're not dealing with tenants toilets. I'm not having to deal with long drawn out evictions. Um, while I've done my fair share of fix and flips, like I, I kind of say I'm allergic to rehabs. I don't particularly enjoy them. And when you think about storage, we're talking about for the most part, concrete block buildings with metal roofs and metal doors, right? I, I don't have plumbing. I don't have some of the things that naturally come with houses and, and, you know, uh, units where people live in it. Uh, and in storage, Jay, there's built in profit centers right? Like, so we charge late fees and auction fees and 24 seven and tenant protection and all these fees that at the end of the day in commercial real estate, the value of the asset is determined by the income that it produces. It's not determined based on comps and like, what did that storage facility sell for? So we get to force the appreciation by increasing the NOI, the net operating income, basically the bottom line. And that is what's going to determine ultimately the value of the facility. So those are just a few of the reasons that I like storage, but by and large, it's a business that can lead to time freedom. I mentioned, um, I think I have a hundred and a little bit over 104,000 net rentable square feet. I don't have any employees. I have a third party management company that manages the day-to-day -day operations. And the bulk of my time and energy is spent not just on coaching people to get their first cash flowing storage facility, but in looking for the right opportunities. Once you find the right opportunity and you get it stabilized, uh, it's a pretty hands-off business. In storage, there's not a lot of emergencies. I like the sound of that. Not a yeah. lot of emergencies. 
I yeah. mean, it, you might it, sleep better at night. Now, you just said it. I want to repeat it. So what you are now doing is you're helping people purchase their very first cash flowing storage facility. You help them do it in less than six months of starting to work with you. And they don't need any experience in doing it. And they don't need any of their own money. So how do right. they find out about that? Yeah, no, th thank you for that. It's and it's it's a joy to like just pour into people and see them win. But if you go to www.storagewins.com, W-I-N-S storagewins.com, there's a, a very short application there. If you just take a minute or two to apply, we can schedule a call to ultimately see if it's a fit. Um, but you know, storage is one of the things that I want to share with people. You don't need to do what I did, you don't need to shut down an existing business because what I now know that I didn't know when I started is that a lot of the skills that I acquired as a single family investor wholesaling, all of those skills transfer over to storage. And with the one thing I can tell you with certainty is that there's less competition and the, the conversations with storage owner operators is to me and to a lot of my clients, a lot easier than trying to deal with a motivated homeowner. Um, so I believe it's my humble opinion that storage is the best asset class out there for numerous reasons. Um, so yeah, uh, Jay storagewins.com for anybody interested in learning more about it. So if you're listening or watching this episode, let me tell you something, you're not going to meet, uh, uh, anybody else that's got any more integrity that really is genuinely interested in serving you and genuinely interested in your success. So take my word for it, Alex Pardo, he has got the most integrity. You want to uh, visit him at www.storagewins, and that's plural, storagewins.com. And of course, we'll have that in the show notes as well. Alex, uh, thank you so much for joining me here on the show today. My friend, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, man, just so happy for your success and I'm grateful for you for all the content you put out for the impact you've had on our community and really just want to encourage your listeners to like hang on every single episode and word because uh, man, you're, you're the type of person, you are the type of person that I want to align myself with to continue to grow in my faith and business and just every aspect of my life, brother. So thank you very much for being a part of it. Thank you, Alex. And God bless you. There you yeah. have it, my friend, another amazing episode of raising private money. I'm Jay Connor, your host. And thank you for joining me and Alex. I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.